Hi everyone, I'm Shelly and you're watching There's No Place Like Home. I'm back with another question the narrative video. And in today's video, I'm actually going to share my thoughts on C.S. Lewis's The Magician's Nephew. Now, please just hear me out on this. I recently finished reading The Magician's Nephew for the first time, and I actually used it as a read aloud for my children. And I wasn't sure if I was going to because I had heard that some people had some misgivings about it, but I started reading it to myself. And after a few pages, I thought to myself, yeah, this is something that I can read to my children because even if there's anything in it that people would consider to be occultic knowledge, my children would not know anyway, and it would also really serve as a springboard for discussion. So people will feel two different ways about C.S. Lewis. They will love him as a Christian author, the author of Mere Christianity, the author of The Screwtape Letters, the author of The Chronicles of Narnia, a beloved allegorical fictional children's um, series. And there are others who have a lot of questions about him because of his involvement in a society called the Inkling Society that has been rumored to have some um, occultic ties and has been rumored also to only be open to those who have a specific bloodline or specific ties to get in and people who could be considered to be adepts in these occultic knowledge. I tell you that it was not easy finding information about the Inkling Society other than the pat answers that, you know, Wikipedia will give you. You get the basic generalities of the Inkling Society, but I really was having a difficult time linking it to any sort of occultic knowledge or the things that the Inkling Society has been accused of. I'm not saying that those ties don't exist, but what I'm saying is in this day and age with search engines, unless you have hours and hours to scroll through hundreds and hundreds of articles, it was not easy. I did find this, so I'm just going to read this. This is only a preview, but it's C.S. Lewis and the Occult Temptation. Twice in his life, C.S. Lewis encountered and greatly admired authors involved in occult theory and practice. The first such figure was William Butler Yeats, the second more than two decades later, Charles Williams. Lewis reacted to their occult preoccupations in quite different ways, even while acknowledging his continuing fascination with the subject. Lewis's admiration for Yeats was experienced mostly at a distance. Preventing a closer relationship were three things. A generational difference. Yeats was 33 years older. Isn't that interesting? 33 years older, of course, than Lewis. A lack of proximity in where they lived, thus keeping personal encounter to a minimum. And finally, a divide over what I am calling the occult temptation. In the case of Williams, conditions for fellowship were far more favorable. The men were closer in age. Williams was older by 12 years. They lived in proximity to one another, and the occult temptation, such as it was, occurred in the context of Lewis's maturing Christian belief and growing reputation as an author. When Williams moved to Oxford at the beginning of World War II, he found the Inklings Literary Group a, go a going concern on the cusp of making itself felt in the worlds of theology and high fantasy. Lewis, guiding light of the group, invited him to join. So I will leave a link in the description box if you wanted to read the rest of this, but really this was the only thing that I was able to find linking the Inkling Society to any sort of esoteric practices. So if you know of any other links, I would love if you would leave them in the description, not in the description, sorry, in the comments. And that's if YouTube even allows them because we know that they delete links very often. So you can try to, to leave some of those or you could even email them to me. I do have my email listed in the description box. But yeah, so this really does explain why people do have some misgivings about C.S. Lewis. Now, I tend to fall sort of in the middle. What I am thinking of is that, to me, it seems apparent that he did have knowledge of things, especially once you read his books, especially Chronicles of Narnia. He had knowledge of occultic things. You can't deny that. 
But I'm curious as to whether he had learned those things before becoming a believer, because it was actually J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of the Lord of the Rings uh, series, who actually converted C.S. Lewis to Christianity, although uh, Tolkien was a Catholic and C.S. Lewis um, was a Protestant, but he, he really was a new Christian. So I'm curious as to whether he actually learned these occultic things before becoming a believer, and if he then decided to write an allegorical series for believers that he would be able to reveal some of this hidden knowledge to, because it is something that the adepts do all the time and through legomanism, which I talked about in another video. So that really just gives you kind of the foundation of where I'm going to be coming at as I look into whether there is any hidden knowledge in this book, things that he is trying to reveal to us. And as with the rest of my question, the narrative videos, these are all what if questions. Um, I don't have the the absolute answers to these questions, but these are all things that came to my mind as I was reading this, this book. And I would love to share them with you because yeah, it's fascinating. Now, if you are looking at this image right here and cringing, I want to say to you, do not turn off the video now because I am not coming at this from a heliocentric perspective. I believe in biblical cosmology. I have not deviated from that at all. But what I have found is that some people, when they hear the word worlds, this is the image that they come up with. They immediately come up with planets. Recently, I had a community post in which I questioned whether or not this book in particular revealed that there are other worlds and people immediately said, no, there's no such thing as outer space. There's no such thing as planets. Worlds does not exclusively mean planets. And it's very important that you understand that. When I speak of worlds, I am referring to other realms. I am not referring to other planets. And I have to point out that the word worlds is used a few times in the Bible. So in 1 Corinthians 2, 7, it says, But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, even the wisdom that hath been hidden, which God foreordained before the worlds unto our glory. And I have to say that the translation of the word worlds, first of all, I did have a friend look into it into the Greek translation. And she said, yes, it definitely does come up as a plural of worlds. Now, some translations will use the word age. Some of them will even use the word universe. But I have to tell you, don't even shy away from the word universe, because it does not have to mean the universe that we have been bombarded with through school and the media. There can be an alternative explanation to universe, and I will get into that. But let's also read Hebrews 1, 2. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. And Hebrews eleven three says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. So there is at least a, some evidence that there may be plural, I'll say realms here so that I don't trigger anyone. Another verse that we can use to at least come to this conclusion is in Ephesians. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Okay, and that is another word that you could use in place of realms. And in fact, we do see that in the Berean Bible, for example, it does say realms. In New International Version, it says realms. Let's see what the King James Version, version says. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There is very clearly another civilization besides ours. And this verse in particular points that out. Um, but I think that very often we are very narrow-minded about what those beings might be. We just picture these 
beautiful angels with these big wings and we think, okay, that's it. Those are the only civil, that's the only civilizations. But we don't know the mind of God. We do not have the mind of God and we don't know specifically what these beings look like. So we're going to start just in chapter three, and I'm not going to be reading this, the book to you today. If you have not read it, I really do encourage that you do it. But in chapter three, it talks about how the two main characters ended up in a place called the wood between the worlds. And what it was, was just this beautiful wooded area that really made you feel completely at peace, almost to the fact of not caring about anything because you're so at peace. And this place is filled with all of these puddles. And the way that they got to this place was they actually came up through a puddle. And in fact, what they soon discover is that each of these puddles likely leads to another world. And this imagery really does remind me of Yggdrasil, the tree in, it's a sacred tree in Norse mythology in which the tree is said to link the nine worlds or the nine realms all together. And as I was reading this book, I was thinking of the wood between the worlds as being this tree and the, the puddles as being these realms. And indeed, C.S. Lewis could have gotten his idea from Norse mythology. Who knows? And just knowing that C.S. Lewis had a lot of hidden knowledge that we ourselves do not have, I couldn't help to, but think to myself as I was reading this, is he trying to tell us something? Is he trying to tell us that there are other realms, other worlds, other places? And yeah, I just mentioned to you about Ephesians where it talks about these, at least at the very least, angelic civilizations. But in my mind, I can't help wondering, is that where so many of these, what we might call fairy, fairy tale creatures come from? There are so many stories coming from so many different cultures of beings that are very similar. And a lot of times, especially in European culture, they're called fairies. They're called gnomes. They're called elves. And I know that I did go over fairies in another video in which I linked them to the Nephilim. But the thing is, is that there are so many people who have had sightings of these very ethereal beings. And I actually have someone who has been commenting who catches them in his game camera. And I would love to see that. Um, so to me, these beings are very real. And the question is, where are they coming from? Could this even be where these lake monsters come from that we hear about and that they never seem to be able to get any evidence of, yet there are so many people who claim to see them? And indeed, could this be where these, quote, aliens are coming from? Because again, I don't believe in the outer space narrative. And a lot of people have come out and said that they have come across these, these beings. And my question is, where are they coming from? I don't know. But could something such as the puddles in the wood between the world be a place where they have been coming from? Could those puddles be some sort of portal? And I have to say that the aliens of today have a lot of similarities of the fairies and the elves of, you know, a couple centuries ago. So are they the same being? I think it's very possible. Going back to the puddles in the wood between the world makes me think of this. The idea that where we are living right now, the earth, is actually one puddle in a place of many puddles. And I think that that is certainly an option. And if you look at it that way, I said that I would get back to outer space. If we do indeed have, like the Bible says, and I believe that we do because the Bible says it, a solid firmament, a rakia over us, anything on the outside of that firmament would could be considered outer space it is a space on the outer part of the dome and so could each of these puddles be a realm could he have been alluding to this i think it's very very possible in fact in another video that i made a while back i explored the possibility that the great deep which is called the abyss in this um, graphic, same place, the abyss and the, and the great deep are the same place. But I explored the possibility of whether the abyss 
here could be connected to the puddles in the other map that I just showed you? Could the abyss be a way to get through to those other places? Because it's interesting that water always seems to come up when it has when when we're talking about portals. Now, if you're physically, you know, going under the water to get to another place, that would not be considered a portal in the way that we typically think of it. But I certainly do think that there is some sort of significance to water, and that is only one option in my mind. But yeah, you know, the, the TV show Stargate, what does that portal look like? It looks like a liquid of some sort, some sort of water, some sort of plasma. Um, here is another photo that I found where a portal is linked to some sort of plasma or some sort of liquid. And it actually makes me think of the firmament video that I made a while back and a tin hat talk that I did on um, Prairie Dust channel. And we talked about the possibility that the firmament itself may have some areas that are plasma for beings like dragons to get through. We don't know. These are all questions that we're just exploring. Mirrors are also known to be used as portals from time to time. I found this one interesting because not only is it a mirror, but it also certainly looks like some sort of liquid in there. But like water, mirrors are a reflective substance. And again, I think that it all just goes back to the puddle imagery that C.S. Lewis is using in this book. So again, the question is, these creatures, these other beings, these other humanoid, um, I'm just going to say creatures again, they, they have been witnessed by so many cultures across the world over generations, over centuries. So there's got to be something. There, there has to be some reason that everyone is reporting these. And so again, my question is now, I've also thought, are they underground? I think that underground is also another possibility, but yeah, living in another realm in which you would need to use some sort of portal to get through. Yes, I think it's possible. We, we live in an, in a time which we're so focused on materialism. Like everybody will only believe what they can see, what is placed before them or what, you know, the great science tells them is possible. And people have completely lost their sense of wonder and they've lost the ability to think for themselves. And they're just so content with having other people tell them what they should be thinking. So after the children find these puddles, they decide that they're going to go into one of these puddles and they end up in this place that is dreadful. The, the sun is just huge and dying and um, it's just very desolate and there's not much there. And they go in the ruins of this stone, possibly palace, and they come to this room filled with all of these stone statues. And I'm just going to read a little bit of it, of that part to you. It says, all the faces they could see were certainly nice. And they're speaking of these statues. Both the men and women looked kind and wise, and they seemed to come of a handsome race. But after the children had gone a few steps down the room, they came to faces that looked a little different. These were very solemn faces. You felt you would have to mind your P's and Q's if you ever met living people who looked like that. When they had gone a little further, they found themselves among faces they didn't like. This was about the middle of the room. The faces here looked very strong and proud and happy, but they looked cruel. A little further on, they looked crueler. Further on again, they were still cruel, but they no longer looked happy. They were even despairing faces, as if the people they belonged to had done dreadful things and also suffered dreadful things. The last figure of all was the most interesting a woman even more richly dressed than the others, very tall, but every figure in that room was taller than the people of our world. You hear that? Taller than the people of our world. Right away, I thought, giants. <laughs> um, with a look of such fierceness and pride that it took your breath away. Yet she was beautiful too. Years afterwards, when he was an old man, Diggory said he had never in all his life known a woman so beautiful. So they come across this room of 
all of these stone people. And the very last one is just a horrifying looking woman, but she's still very beautiful. And that's one thing that, that they have in common with what we hear of the Nephilim, that they were very tall. They were very beautiful, but they were also very, very fierce. So at the end of this chapter, though, they are tempted to ring a bell and hammer, which the boy decides to do. And what happens? Well, this last statue of this woman, she comes to life. And so immediately when I'm thinking of the bell and hammer, I'm thinking of frequencies. Was there some sort of frequency that was used to bring this statue to life? And so it's the same question that I actually had and that actually some of my friends had about the flood bodies videos. And I really encourage you to check this out. Unfortunately, unfortunately, it looks like they have not made videos in quite some time, but they're fascinating. But the premise is that there are many what we call statues nowadays that seem to be petrified human beings that were frozen um, just suddenly, spontaneously. Almost like sometimes we will find fossils of, you know, fish who are in the middle of giving birth, something that quick. And the idea is that this very well could have happened during the flood when the waters above hit these people, these beings who were there at this point in time. So one question that was brought up is, is there any way that these people could have been reanimated or could be reanimated someday? Oh, that's not the picture I was looking for. So as you go through the flood bodies playlist, and I, again, I don't agree with absolutely everything that he says, but the premise itself, I think that it, it has merit. Many of these beings do seem to be Nephilim or angelic beings frozen in time. And so you have to ask yourself, is this book trying to tell us something else? We always talk about petrified Titans, right? These Titans in, in the mountains. Um, and I've actually talked about that before. Are these all things that are going to be reanimated someday? And you, and you might be thinking to yourself, that's, that's completely absurd. Where is she coming from with all of this? Well, I have to say that there is something in the Bible that certainly could allude to something like that. Here we have in Revelation 13, 15, and it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. If we look up here in the New Living Translation, it is called the statue. So this statue suddenly has the ability to speak. Is this something that he is alluding to, this reanimation of these petrified beings? As terrifying as it would be to have all of these statues around you start coming to life, imagine the gigantic titans that it seems to be, um, that seem to be embedded in so many of our mountains. Now, this is not one of them, but this is I think this is the one that Roger Spur actually did a biological sample on and found that there was some sort of, um, I'll just say biological specimen in it. I don't remember exactly what it was, but yeah, it just, look at these, these, yeah, they'd be pretty horrifying if they were reanimated someday. If these are indeed petrified titans, it would be horrifying for these to suddenly come out, break out of the mountains. It reminds me of, um, there's an anime that I have watched only one season of called Attack on Titan. And I know that in this anime, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it, these Titans are actually, they start coming, they're coming out of the walls that are built around the city. And the whole idea just reminds me of that plot, this Attack on Titan plot. And, you know, there are so many shows, so many movies that, that seem to have some sort of, I don't know whether you could call it instinct, whether they just know innately that something is going on, 
or possibly have insider information. I don't know, but so many shows and movies, especially nowadays, seem to be desperately trying to tell us something or they seem to be kind of waving it in our faces and just figuring that we'll never know what they're trying to tell us anyway. So in chapter five, that's actually when this statue comes to life. And I'm just going to read to you a small passage from there. It says, one of the robed figures, the furthest off, one of all, the woman whom Diggory thought so beautiful was rising from its chair. When she stood up, they realized that she was even taller than they had thought. So again, this is just screaming to me, giants, Nephilim, um, petrified Nephilim. Then if you go down a few paragraphs, it says, you, said the queen, laying her hand on his shoulder, a white, beautiful hand. But Diggory could feel that it was strong as steel pinchers. Now I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to read a little bit after that, but I just want to stop right there because one thing that it talks about in this book is it keeps describing how white this, this, we'll call her a witch, this queen, whatever she is, how pale she is how white she is. And this reminds me of the Genesis 6 conspiracy, something that I have shared here multiple times, and I'm going to keep sharing it because there's so much information in here. If you've seen my video on fairies, you may know that I read an, an excerpt from Genesis 6 conspiracy in which he gave the derivation of the word fae, the word for fairy. It actually comes from the word fair because these beings were known to be very, very fair. And here in, again, the Genesis 6 conspiracy, I'll just read you one portion. It says Guinevere, and this is referring to the Guinevere of Merlin lore. Guinevere was also of fairy blood. Her name translates as white fairy from the fairy folk of Wales. Other translations suggest Guinevere means white phantom or white apparition. Gwyn is Welsh for white or fair. So yes, again, this is all, all of the books that I have been reading recently. Just the culmination of them are coming through this fictional novel by C.S. Lewis. So I'm just going to go back and read a little bit more of this part. It says, you said the queen laying her hand on his shoulder. And she had asked who broke the spell, a white, beautiful hand, but Diggory could feel that it was strong as steel pinchers. You, but you are only a child, a common child. Anyone can see at a glance that you have no drop of royal or noble blood in your veins. How did such as you dare to enter this house? And one thing, if you have been into the truth movement for any period of time, you know that these royal bloodlines, these noble bloodlines, all seem to have some sort of ties to the occult, to magic. Um, in fact, the, the royal bloodlines have become synonymous with fairy bloodlines, with dragon bloodlines, with elven bloodlines, and they all have ties back to magic. So all of these royal people, people in quotes, all of these nobles, they have magic in their blood and we common folk do not. And that is one distinction. Why do they have that magic? Because they come from the Nephilim. So this is also from the Genesis 6 conspiracy. And I'm just going to read right here because it says Merlins were the great seers of the Gaelic realms for the royal courts and high kings. They were a class of Druid priests akin to the classical Greek philosophers and Chaldean Magi who were derived from an ancient priestly tribe remembered as the Wise Ones. In Latin, Merlins and Wise Ones were identified as the Noblis, from the Greek noble, meaning to know, as in gnosis. Hence, noble, just as fair, fairy Celts were the noble race of the elven bloodline. So all of this esoteric information is coming through this novel if you only know where to look. You know, it makes me think of the whole Sangreal myth, the, the, what, what they will try to tell you is the Holy Grail, but is actually linked to the elven bloodline. 
it's all tied together. In fact, on page 42 in chapter 5, as if you have a copy and I'm telling you the pages like you need to know that. I'm speaking more to myself at this point. But on page 42, again, I'm telling you, um, it says, okay, it says, does not magic always go with the royal blood? And that's just like more confirmation to me. Yes, it does. Yes, it does always go with the royal blood. Another thing that we learn, um, I might have forgotten to write the chapter down, is that this queen destroyed her, her realm. Remember, I told you that everything was just completely desolate. Um, and it's because she learned a magical word of destruction one word that destroyed her entire world and her world was called charn again don't think of planet think of realm okay it her that one word destroyed her realm and i couldn't help but think how god spoke everything to into existence he spoke it into existence and he created everything by the word and here we have in this novel this this Nephilim queen. Yes, I'm going to call her a Nephilim. She destroyed her realm also with a word. And it just made me think of the whole idea of the gap in Genesis 1 verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So when you just read that, you know, give it a cursory glance, you don't really think much of it. But when you are actually translating it from the Hebrew, the word was can actually be translated as became. And it could read in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth became formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And if you look at it that way, you have to remember that our God is a God of order and he would not create something that is formless and empty. And in fact, the words tohu va bohu are used in, for, for formless and empty. And it means something that is completely destroyed um, through a judgment of some sort. So as her world is kind of described, her world charn, it made me think of this formless and empty world. And could it be an allegorical to some sort of civilization, yes, I'm going to say it, that possibly may have been here before God remade everything for us in the seven days of creation, six days of creation, seventh day of rest. Now in chapter 11, we have Aslan speaking. This is a different topic now. I've kind of moved somewhere else. In chapter 11, Aslan says, and as Adam's race has done the harm, Adam's race shall help to heal it. Draw near, you other two. And so I just keep thinking Adam's race. And even if you go further ahead into um, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the White Witch, and in fact, the Fawn, they, they call the, the character Lucy a daughter of Eve. And so... This kind of just brought to mind the idea that there may have been another race besides the, the lineage of Adam and Eve. And I'm not going to get into the whole thing again in this video, but you can go through my question, the narrative playlist. I have talked about this before. I'm not saying that I'm 100% sold on it. I'm just saying that I find it interesting and it doesn't take away from God's glory at all. And so I just, yeah, it's something that I like to think about. But the fact that they just say it is Adam's race. Adam's race has done the harm. Adam's race shall help to heal it. And, you know, Jesus was chosen from the line of Adam because it was Adam and Eve who sinned in the Garden of Eden. And yes, um, Jesus was chosen from their line because they were the ones who messed up. Right. So could there have been others who were not a part of Adam's race? I think it's a possibility. Now, in this book, there are actually, and I found this also to be intriguing, we often think of like what, what we would call these hybrid creatures as being um, abominations that were created 
by the the Nephilim, um, and it's it's talked about in the Book of Enoch, not not really explicitly. I think it's very ambiguous language about what they mean, but we we usually associate things like satyrs, or sometimes called fauns, as being you know just created by evil. In this book, it was Aslan who, and, and Aslan is symbolic for Jesus. Aslan created the satyrs, which is interesting if you actually will, <laughs> will look at what satyrs are usually associated with. If you actually look up some illustrations of them, you might think, hmm, yeah. And I'm not saying that, that God created satyrs, but what I'm saying is that in this book, it does seem to allude to the fact that there was another race of sentient beings created. Um, and it also says that Aslan created the dwarves too. That also in itself, I find interesting because the dwarves are associated in this book and actually not in this book, in all lore with um, smithing, like of, of being blacksmiths, of being, you know, builders of some sort. And isn't it interesting that the son of Cain, remember Cain was expelled from the garden. He went and found a wife somewhere. Some people say it was a sister. Some people say, no, he found it from the other people who were, who were living at the time. It's very interesting though, that the, um, the son of Cain, Tubal Cain, he is also known for smithing and the very sort of things that these dwarves are known for. And these dwarves were actually not Adam's race. They were another race that was created for Narnia. So take from that what you will. I just found that, you know, to be something that I that was worth mentioning. And the last thing that I'm going to mention today, I may have missed a lot. These are just the things that I was able to pull to pull from it. There could be so much more if I would dig into it more deeply. It's just that with homeschooling six children and trying to keep up with the house, I can't dig into things right now as much as I would like to. This is what I have found. But um, in chapter 15, at the very end of the book, Aslan says, when you were last here, that hollow was a pool. And when you jumped into it, you came to the world where a dying sun shone over the ruins of Charn. There is no pool now. That world is ended as if it had never been. Let the race of Adam and Eve take warning. And that again, that alluded to the fact of um, our world taking the place of Charn or Narnia taking the place of Charn. And was there another world before that our world took the place of? And if not that, have there been other worlds? Again, not planets, other realms. Have they, were there any in the past? Are there any others right now? Um, are there other civilizations? And are there any that, like Charn, were completely destroyed? And I'm going to say yes, at the very least, to something being destroyed. And we know, again, there were angelic civilizations, but we, we can't be narrow-minded about what those angelic beings might be. They could include these ethereal creatures. We seem to have um, a very either a medieval picture of what these angelic beings would be in our minds or a very Renaissance idea. And, you know, the Bible doesn't tell us a whole lot about these things. So my question is, what else is out there? Anyway, that's all that I have for you today. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed yet and would like to hear more of what I have to say, I would love if you would do that. If you have any questions or comments, you can leave one either here or over on Instagram. And if you like my work and would like to check out my Patreon page, I will leave a link in the description box for that as well. And I hope you have a great day.